Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn de Weyer and this is Outsiders, Part 1, Ireland's Last Executioners. Over the past year, I've been making the podcast series on the Great Irish Famine, but for the coming few weeks around Christmas, I'm taking a short break to make a mini-series called Outsiders. Over the next few weeks, you're going to hear some fascinating stories of what were outsiders in Irish history. People who for one reason or another have been forgotten by Irish historians or lived on the margins of society in Ireland. These outsiders, as you will see over the course of the series, have very little or nothing in common. Indeed, in some cases, they were bitter enemies. Their lives were nonetheless intriguing chapters in our history, frequently overlooked. Today, I'm kicking off the series with Ireland's last executioners. The show begins with a completely forgotten story, the arrival of two Englishmen in Ireland in the depths of World War II on a deadly mission and travelling under false identities. On November 29th, 1944, two Englishmen entered Ireland through Dublin Airport, travelling under false names, calling themselves Thomas Clark and Albert Clough, they were keen to hide their true identities. While their first names were actually Thomas and Albert, it was their real last name which had the potential to cause trouble. Indeed, there was very good reason for the secrecy around their visit to Ireland. They had come to kill the chief of staff of the IRA, which naturally made them wanted men in many quarters. Undaunted by what lay ahead, the two individuals travelled under their assumed names from Dublin Airport to the city centre. Then, on December the 1st, they made their way to Mount Joy Jail in the suburb of Fibsborough, where the IRA Chief of Staff, Charlie Kearns, was being held, having been convicted of the murder of a policeman. The two men successfully entered the prison, and later that day, Kearns was pronounced dead. In the aftermath, the two Englishmen, still using their false names of Clark and Clough, left the prison and returned to England safely. Now this is a truly remarkable story. At the height of World War II, two Englishmen were able to murder the Chief of Staff of the IRA, then being held in a Dublin prison, and escape back to England. However, it's not as strange as it initially seems. This is because you've probably made one assumption which is incorrect. While the two men who executed Charlie Kearns were English, they were not agents of the British government. They had in fact been paid and invited to Ireland by the Irish government. It was the Irish court system which had in fact sentenced Charlie Kearns to death and the government having stood over the decision hired the services of these two English executioners to travel to Ireland and hang Kearns. They were not hiding their identities from the Irish authorities but rather sections of the Irish public who would have had sympathy for the IRA and its chief of staff Charlie Kearns. If the executioners' real names had been made known, there would have been many who would have quickly realised who they were and what they were doing in Ireland. While they travelled under the aliases of Clark and Clough, the two men's real names were Thomas and Albert Pierpoint, a surname synonymous with death in the early 20th century because they hailed from England's most infamous family of hangmen. While Charlie Kearns was probably among the most famous His was just one of dozens of death sentences handed down and carried out in Ireland after independence. Given Ireland had no trained executioners, on the vast majority of occasions when a death sentence was handed down by the courts, the government hired the services of the peer points to carry out this grim business. While the elder of the two men, Thomas Pierpoint, oversaw proceedings in the majority of the executions. It was his assistant and ultimate successor, his nephew Albert, who was the most famous. These two men were outsiders in Irish history in all ways. They were Ireland's last executioners. To fully understand this family and their strange and bizarre connection to Ireland, I want to start by focusing on the life of the younger of the two, Albert Pierpoint. Family businesses often leave children pursuing strange career paths, but none so strange as the Pierpoint family of Bradford, England. 
Albert Pierpoint, who would go on to be Ireland's last executioner, was born in 1905, the son of Henry and Mary Pierpoint. Ostensibly, the young Albert thought his father Henry was a clogger, an ancient trade which fashioned wooden shoes called clogs. However, the boy's father had a sideline business, one that was hidden from the child when he was a young boy. From time to time, Henry Pierpoint would travel away from home on work. It wasn't until he was 11, after his father had retired, that the young Albert finally discovered what this business was. One day, he saw a newspaper advertising his father's recollections of this work, which had taken him away from their home. The story must have been a revelation for the young child. His father, Henry Pierpoint, had in fact been a hangman. However, rather than recoil in horror at the fact that his father was a trained killer, the young Pierpoint appears to have embraced it. Certainly his family saw no shame in the macabre business and they did not try and discourage the young Albert from what was increasingly a family trade. Albert would later recall that his father told him, after he found out this secret, that he would indeed grow up to become the official executioner in England. However, judging on his autobiography, written later in life, it appears that it was his uncle Thomas, also an executioner, who influenced the boy most. In either case, from a very young age, Albert Pierpoint was keen to emulate his father and uncle Thomas in their choice of career. He even opened a school essay with the line, When I leave school, I should like to be the official executioner. While Albert would one day become an executioner, this podcast is primarily concerned with his and the other Pierpoint family's activities in Ireland. So to continue the story, I now need to introduce Albert's uncle, Thomas, who was responsible for extending what might be called the family business to Ireland. Albert's father, Henry, had retired as an executioner in 1910, drawing to a close a 10-year career, during which he had only visited Ireland once to execute a man in Dublin. A heavy drinker, Henry Pierpoint died relatively young in 1922, while Albert was still only 16. However, in the intervening period between his retirement and his death, Albert's uncle, Henry's brother, Thomas, had become a well-known hangman in England, a reputation that would soon spread to Ireland. While he established himself throughout Britain, Thomas Pierpoint had never hanged anyone in Ireland prior to the Irish War of Independence, which broke out in 1919. During that conflict, numerous Irish people were sentenced to death, but most were shot by firing squad by British Army soldiers. In 1922, 26 counties of Ireland gained independence and contrary to popular opinion, the death penalty was not abolished. Indeed, the opening year of independence was one of terrible bloodletting. A civil war broke out six months after the War of Independence drew to a close and the new Irish government sentenced dozens of individuals to death. The Pierpoints, however, were not involved in these executions, as the men were not hanged but executed by firing squad. However, in 1923, the Civil War had drawn to a close and the government had emerged victorious. While a new court system, army and currency were all established, the issue of training a hangman was not dealt with, probably because it was considered a bit of a dirty business no one wanted to face up to. That said, the judicial system did not stop handing out death sentences. In December 1923, Thomas Delaney murdered and robbed a 74-year-old man called Patrick Hogan. He was sentenced to death and with no hangman available, this left officials in a quandary. It fell to the Sheriff of Dublin then to write to Thomas Pierpoint to ask him to come to Ireland. In the National Library of Ireland, there are a remarkable series of letters around these early executions, which give a great insight into attitudes at the time. When the Sheriff of Dublin wrote to Thomas Pierpoint, asking him to come to Ireland to carry out an execution, they generally wrote in vague terms, referring to the execution as the operation, or on one occasion using the term professional engagement. He seemed to be reticent to use the term execution, almost not facing up to the fact of what he was engaged in. He even would refer to the executioner as the operator. It appears that there was a certain degree of shame surrounding the whole business in post-independence Ireland. Conversely, the peer points who were quite proud of their jobs never showed any such qualms. For example, in November 1923, when the Sheriff of Dublin wrote to Thomas Pierpoint asking would he carry out the first criminal execution 
in post-independence Ireland, Pierpoint replied saying he was, and I quote, very pleased to oblige. In what was one of his first journeys to post-independence Ireland, Thomas Pierpoint was clearly somewhat nervous about the fact that he was an English hangman returning to Ireland, which had won its independence from Britain in a bloody struggle. There were clearly concerns for his safety. After returning to England, having carried out the execution, he wrote to the Sheriff of Dublin, I arrived home quite safe and without trouble. I had a good look around Dublin well into the afternoon. I kept hearing conversations about the execution at Mount Joy, but I never let on. Even the sailors on board were looking out for the hangman. Judging on this, he had thought there was a risk of trouble. However, it didn't deter him from coming back to Ireland in the coming years and decades. Indeed, this was just the first of Thomas Pierpoint's dozens of visits to Ireland. He had returned several times before he came in 1925 to execute one of 20th century Ireland's most brutal murderers. After the corpse of Patrick O'Leary was found chopped up into several pieces on his farm in Cork, his mother, brother and sister were arrested and tried for the murder. His brother Cornelius and his sister Hannah were convicted and Thomas Pierpoint executed Cornelius after he was sentenced to death. It was only in the 1930s that Thomas Pierpoint brought over a new assistant, the man who had proved to be the most famous hangman of the 20th century, his nephew Albert. Although he had grown up surrounded by executioners and embraced the family craft, Albert Pierpoint did not immediately train as a hangman, but instead worked in various jobs until finally in 1933 he spent time in Strangeways prison training under his uncle Thomas. The role of executioner had changed massively in the previous 50 years, so it's worth taking a little detour to look at exactly what Albert was signing up for. Up until the early 19th century, hangmen had been as much public entertainers as executioners. Some hangings could be attended by tens of thousands of people and the places of execution, such as Tyburn in London, were akin to the Colosseum. By the early 19th century, attitudes were changing and executions were moved to prisons, but still took place in public. Then, in 1868, these spectacles were finally ended when all executions took place behind closed doors inside prisons with very few witnesses. Quickly, they became a solemn affair. The hangman of old with his theatrics were a thing of the past. Instead, it became the work of solemn, black-suited men no longer entertaining huge crowds. This was the career Albert Pierpoint was signing up for in 1933, but his training was more complex than you might imagine. Being a hangman was not simply a matter of turning up, putting a noose over someone's neck, pulling a handle and watch them drop through a trapdoor to their death. There was a certain amount of maths and science involved in Albert's training in Strangeways Prison in England. For example, the length of rope used was crucial. If the rope was too short, it would not snap the neck and the individual sentenced to death would be left dangling at the end of the rope for several minutes. Alternatively, if the rope used was too long, the force of the drop could decapitate the person. However, in Thomas Pierpoint, Albert had an excellent teacher and he did instill in his nephew the importance of taking the macabre job seriously. Many previous hangmen were prone to drinking for Dutch courage before they carried out death sentences, but Thomas Pierpoint was adamant that if it could not be done sober, it should not be done at all. There was actually good reason for this due to a family scandal. Albert Pierpoint's father, Henry, who we met earlier, had not actually retired like Albert thought, but instead he had been fired. In British state papers released in the early 2000s, it has emerged that in 1910, Albert's father turned up at Chelmsford Prison heavily drunk and started a fight with the assistant hangman, John Ellis, calling him an Irish bastard. After this, Winston Churchill, then the Home Secretary in England, demanded that Pierpoint never be hired as an executioner again. However, having been trained by his uncle, Thomas, a very different man, Albert Pierpoint would prove to be far more competent than his father. When he completed his training in 1933, there were few executions in England at the time and his first commission was actually in Dublin when he and his uncle Thomas were hired by the Irish government to travel to Ireland and hang Patrick McDermott, a man sentenced to death for murdering his own brother. Although Thomas Pierpoint had been coming to Ireland for nine years at this point, he still did not feel very safe. If anything, he was even more concerned about his security. On what was Albert Pierpoint's first visit, his Uncle Thomas carried a gun. 
On that occasion, they were chased by a crowd of young men when they arrived at the port, but nevertheless, they reached Dublin safely and carried out the execution. In the following years, between 1932 and 1939, the two travelled to Ireland frequently to hang three more men convicted of murder. John Fleming in 1934, John Horrock in 1937 and Dermot Smith in 1939. A few months after they executed Smith though, world events took over and would change Albert Pierpoint's life and indeed Ireland. This is of course World War II. But before we look at this, I want to take a breather. When World War II broke out in September 1939, it drove up demand for the Pierpoint's services as increased numbers of people were sentenced to death in Britain during the war. While this is something I will look at later in the podcast, the situation in Ireland changed dramatically as well, so that's what I'm going to focus on now. In 1939, Eamon de Valera and his Fianna Fáil party were in power, and they chose a path of neutrality in the war, supporting neither Nazi Germany nor the Allies. However, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, a paramilitary organisation, were seeking to gain independence for Ireland's six counties still under British rule, and they saw the war as an opportunity and waged attacks against Britain, setting off a few bombs in English cities during the war. Indeed, in February 1940, the Pierpoints executed two Irishmen, Peter Barnes and James McCormick, in a Birmingham prison for setting off a bomb in Coventry. Back in Ireland, the government cracked down on the IRA. Large numbers were interned in camps in the Curra, County Kildare. In 1940, two members of the IRA were sentenced to death and executed in Mountjoy Jail, but on this occasion the Pierpoints were not involved as these men were shot by firing squad. They did come back to Ireland in 1941 to carry out four separate executions. In Mountjoy Jail in Dublin, they hanged Daniel Doherty, Henry Gleeson and Patrick Gleeson in separate executions for murder. Also that year, the Pierpoints carried out their first hanging outside Dublin when they travelled to Port Leash Prison and executed the IRA member Richard Goss, who had fired a gun at a policeman. They returned to Ireland in 1943 to execute two more civilians convicted of murder. Then, in 1944, as we saw at the start of the show, they carried out the execution of Charlie Kearns, the IRA Chief of Staff. This proved to be one of Thomas Pierpoint's final executions. He was well into his 70s at this stage and he retired that year, leaving Albert to continue. The end of World War II in May 1945 brought Albert Pierpoint unprecedented fame around the globe. As the Allies captured numerous Nazi war criminals and British traitors who had helped the Nazis, many of whom were sentenced to death, it fell to Albert to execute them. The most famous of these was probably Lord Haw Haw, a.k.a. William Joyce, an Irish-American who had been a Nazi propagandist. Another high-profile case was that of John Amory. The son of Leo Amory, one of Winston Churchill's ministers during the war, John Amory had actually chosen to fight for the Nazis. Captured in Italy by Italian partisans, he was handed over to the British. Even his high-profile connections could not save the fascist, and he was sentenced to death for treason. Pierpoint arrived in Wandsworth Prison on December the 19th, 1945, to hang Amory, who reputedly said to the executioner, Mr. Pierpoint, I've always wanted to meet you, but not, of course, under these circumstances. The Christmas season of 1945 was a busy time for Albert Pierpoint. He also travelled to the continent, where he dispatched over a dozen Nazi war criminals. In one day, December 13th, 1945, he began executions in Hamlin Prison at 9.34 in the morning. Nearly seven hours later, he finished his day's work, having hanged 13 people, including Joseph Kramer, the former commandant of the Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen concentration camps. These executions brought Albert Pierpoint great fame, and he became something of a national celebrity in Britain. He did, however, continue to execute criminals after the war. In 1951, he would reputedly carry out the fastest execution in history, dispatching James Inglis in seven seconds, That's the time between the moment he entered the execution chamber and pulled the lever. Albert Pierpoint also travelled to Ireland on three more occasions after World War II. In 1947, he made his familiar journey to Mountjoy Jail to execute Joseph McManus, a man who had murdered his girlfriend. Then in probably one of the most controversial hangings of modern history, he returned in 1948 to carry out the death sentence passed down on a man called William Gambon, 
Gambon's story was tragic. In an incident still not fully understood, he got into an altercation with a close friend called John Long. Despite the fact that Long was married, some have speculated the two may have been lovers. In the course of the argument, Gambon struck Long with an iron bar, but when he later discovered Gambon died from his injuries, he was devastated and struck with remorse. He immediately turned himself in to the police. Despite pleas for clemency, given it was clearly manslaughter and the fact Gambon had turned himself in, the government would not back down. Many felt it was Gambon's class background as a poor labourer that sealed his fate. Had he been wealthier, he surely would not have been executed. In the following years, murder sentences in Ireland became far less common as opposition to the death penalty grew steadily. However, in the early 1950s, Ireland was rocked by a brutal killing. On November 18, 1953, Michael Manning, a 25-year-old man from Limerick, brutally attacked a 65-year-old nurse called Catherine Cooper as she walked home on a dark country lane. Manning raped Cooper in an extremely violent manner and she died during the attack. He attempted to defend himself with a plea of insanity, saying he was out of his mind on drink. However, this was dismissed out of hand by the judge. Manning was sentenced to die in March 1954. An unsuccessful appeal did delay matters, but Albert Pierpoint eventually made his journey to Dublin a few weeks later. On April 20th, 1954, at 8 o'clock in the morning, Albert Pierpoint walked into the hang room in Mount Joy Jail and dispatched the rapist and murderer Michael Manning. After the hanging, Albert Pierpoint left Ireland, not knowing this was one of his last ever cases and Ireland's last execution. By 1954, Pierpoint had become probably the most famous hangman of all time, a dubious honour heightened by his involvement in the Nazi executions. While medieval executioners were considered pariahs, almost outcast from society, Pierpoint had become the exact opposite. He was feted by the press and something of a national hero. By 1951, such was his status in society that a church in Derbyshire, England, invited Pierpoint to open a garden party it had organised as a fundraiser. Of his final executions, perhaps the most famous was that of the English serial killer John Christie, who Pierpoint hanged in 1953. Christie had killed multiple women, including his own wife, at their flat in Billington Place in Notting Hill. In a tragic side note to this case, Pierpoint had already executed the innocent Timothy Evans, for some of Christie's murders. Albert Pierpoint's long career ended in somewhat acrimonious circumstances in February 1956 when he resigned as executioner in England after a dispute with the government over payment. Back in Ireland, it was increasingly obvious that Pierpoint would be the country's last executioner. In 1964, new legislation abolished the death sentence in most cases except treason, the murder of diplomats and the murder of policemen. The Irish army were also allowed to carry out death sentences in certain cases as well. In the coming years and decades, a number of death sentences were handed down by Irish courts, but these were all commuted before the hangings could take place. While Albert Pierpoint was Ireland's last executioner, one man did try and take this title from him in what is a bizarre postscript to this story. While researching this show, I came across an unusual letter in the National Archives of Ireland, written to the Irish government in 1976. In that year, two Irish anarchists, Mary and Noel Murray, were sentenced to death for the murder of a policeman. However, by this stage, Ireland had no executioner, nor did Britain, which had, by this stage, abolished the death penalty and had not carried out an execution in over a decade. This detail appears to have been carried in newspapers around the world that reported the Murray case. Preserved in the National Archives is a truly bizarre letter, though, sent from North America to the Irish government. From what I can ascertain, the individual who wrote this was pretty young at the time and is still alive, so I don't see any merit in naming them now. In any case, they wrote to the Irish government, offering to become what would have been Ireland's last executioner. The letter reads, Dear Sir, I read in the paper that you have two condemned murderers to be hanged and no one to hang them. As one who wants to help keep law and order, I should like to volunteer for the job. In fact, I will do it at no charge, except the cost of my plane ticket to and from Ireland. The Irish government did not avail of this offer and the death sentence on the Murrays was eventually commuted to a lengthy prison sentence. In Northern Ireland, which is still part of the United Kingdom, the last official and legal execution took place in 1961. However, it was Albert Pierpoint's execution of the rapist and murderer Michael Manning in 1954 
that was the last execution that took place in the Republic of Ireland. Albert Pierpoint died 25 years ago in 1992. Through the course of his life, it is estimated he executed between 400 and 600 people. Pierpoint was in many ways a very strange individual. Pictures of the man contained in the patron's guide to this episode, available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast, depict a jovial man, certainly not the sinister figure we imagine with our face covered in black cloth, the way hangmen are traditionally depicted. It is said that Pierpoint came to the conclusion later in life that the death penalty was not an effective method of punishment. However, at the same time, he had a curious relationship and attitude to his work. In his entry in the Dictionary of National Biography, Brian Bailey commented on the fact that Pierpoint always stated, I had to hang X or I had to hang Y. In fact, he did not have to hang anyone. He chose to carry out his macabre work. It was a job he was willing to do. That's where I'm going to leave this podcast on the first of the outsiders in Irish history. Next up, I'll be looking at the story of Otto Skorzeny, one of the most notorious Nazis ever to visit Ireland. I've spent a lot of time in archives following his story and it's pretty extraordinary. So that's going to be out in the next week or two. Until then, Sloan, 